Well, hey everybody, this is Robert, and welcome to Outbreak News TV. And on today's show, I want to take a little uh, look at the uh, testing situation for COVID-19. And I want to start out with the disaster, how it started, um, talk a little bit about that, uh, and look at where we're going, and a little stuff in between. So um, let's take a look at the testing. And it all started uh, a couple months ago several months ago with the uh, early failures of the CDC and this report outlines it pretty clearly of what happened. The CDC began working on a test within the first few weeks of the outbreak in conjunction with the FDA. Um, on January 21st, all plans and anticipations were suddenly brought to term when the U.S. confirmed its first case of the virus in Seattle. Uh, the patient zero checked into an emergency care center two weeks or two days prior, which was able to send clinical samples from his nose, throat, and bloodstream to the CDC in Atlanta. By the following afternoon, the lab had reported that the test came back positive. And here we go. Uh, COVID-19 had arrived in the U.S. And of course, we know now that based on some autopsy results that it was here before that and as Two uh, cases were reported in California based on autopsy results. Well, on January 24th, the CDC digitally published information on its tests, essentially providing a blueprint for manufacturing them. It was clear that clinical and public health labs had to be capable of testing in case the virus became widespread. On January 31st, the uh, HHS designated the coronavirus a public health emergency and four days later declaring this condition uh, uh, caused the FDA to authorize the emergency use of diagnostic tests. Emergency use authorizations bypassed the years-long approval process, accelerate the pace at which the medical products reach labs and hospitals. This is the FDA at its most flexible. However, the layers of red tape still in force during such an emergency were thick and tangled. Labs could only use tests that had been developed themselves if granted an EUA, which was given solely to the CDC on February 4. All other labs were prohibited from using their own tests, though many were already in the process of manufacturing them. The CDC's kits use polymerase chain reaction testing, or PCR, common and inexpensive diagnostic method that's been used for decades. As long as state and clinical labs could ensure the uber clean lab conditions required to develop coronavirus PCR primer, uh, these are short DNA strands complementary to the SARS coronavirus 2 viral sequence, there would be no trouble manufacturing the test kits. They were fully capable. Now, given the CDC the sole power to manufacture tests, on the other hand, would ultimately mean that fewer would be made and of lower quality. But against the interest of public health and practicality, production was centralized with the CDC anyway. Now, for more than two weeks, all testing had to be conducted via mail-in samples sent to the CDC, the same as with the first Seattle patient. On February 6th and 7th, the CDC finally sent public health labs the test kits they had been anxiously awaiting. At this time, this was only 90 tests, though each one could process seven to 800 patient samples, a suitable capability for the time, but one which would have to be expanded as the virus spread further. Now, after receiving the tests, the labs began to check them to ensure they would produce valid results. However, nearly all the labs ran into a problem with one of the test negative control reagents, and that's the notorious N3. The test reagents contained genetic material unrelated to SARS coronavirus 2, and that was not supposed to react, but how the labs would have been able to validate the test accuracy. But in most labs, the N3 did react, causing a stir of panic that the tests were defective. The CDC, excuse me, the CDC publicly recognized its blunder on February 12th and committed itself to making a quick amends. At that point, only three labs not facing reagent problems out of more than 100 public health labs were allowed to continue testing. All other labs had to again send their samples to the CDC 
um, Atlanta lab, delaying results up to two days, which would have otherwise taken four to six hours to produce at a time when knowledge of the virus spread was crucial. So to address this failure, the CDC initially planned to manufacture new operative copies of N3 to send to the labs that had difficulties, but this never came to fruition. Instead, for the next few weeks, CDC officials continuously declared that they were working on the problem, ultimately helping to equip only an extra nine public health labs and the ability to test. A cocktail of bureaucratic incompetence and FDA lethargy left the other labs without usable tests as the virus spread undetected across the country. Finally, at the end of February, February 26, and the CDC announced a grand solution. The labs would simply disregard the faulty N3 uh, primer or target and otherwise continue using the test as originally sent to them. That means there was never anything faulty, defective about them in the first place and that testing could have been continued uninterrupted for the prior couple of weeks. The real issue at hand was not the test, but the changing the test protocol to reflect what many virologists already knew, that having a third reagent was super, superfluous to begin with. That's not even to mention the five public health labs that experienced problems with the reagents besides N3, to which the CDC failed to propose a solution. All right, so that's that's what happened. So they sent out all these test kits to the state labs. We try to validate it. N3 failed put on hold, we're wait, waiting and waiting for several weeks. Finally, they say, okay, just ignore the N3, don't run it, validate it with the N1 and N2, and let it fly. So that took nearly a, three to four weeks for all that to come to fruition before the state public health labs were able to start testing. And then we find out more recently, this report from the New York Times came out on April 18th, that these labs at the CDC that were making these test kits were contaminated. And let's see what they say. They say sloppy laboratory practices at the CDC caused contamination that rendered the nation's first coronavirus test ineffective, uh, federal officials confirmed. Two of the three CDC laboratories in Atlanta that created the coronavirus test kits violated their own manufacturing standards resulting in the agency sending tests that did not work to nearly all of the 100 state and public health and local public health labs, according to the FDA. Early on, the FDA, which oversees laboratory tests, sent Dr. Timothy Stenzel, chief of in vitro diagnostics and radiologic health, to the CDC labs to assess the problem. He found an astonishing lack of expertise in commercial manufacturing and learned that nobody was in charge of the entire process, they said. Problems range from researchers entering and exiting coronavirus laboratories without changing their coats to test ingredients being assembled in the same room where researchers were working on positive coronavirus samples. Those practices made the tests sent to the public health labs unusable because they were contaminated with the coronavirus and produced some inconclusive results. In a statement on Saturday, a week ago Saturday, uh, a spokeswoman for the FDA, Stephanie Kakomo, said, quote, CDC did not manufacture its test consistent with its own protocol, protocol, close quote. All right, so, so there we see the blunder. We see what went wrong and why testing got started so slow in the United States. Let's talk about how accurate these tests are. And this is a pretty interesting article. It's uh, from April 16th and is written by a couple of researchers out of the University of Bristol in England. And it says coronaviruses, how accurate are coronavirus tests? Question mark. And they say there are two main types of COVID-19 tests. Of course, the swab test, which usually take a sample from the nose or throat to detect viral RNA. These determine if you currently have COVID-19. And then, of course, there's the blood test, which detect antibodies, which can determine if you had COVID-19 or are therefore immune. And we'll discuss that in a little bit. They go on to say no test is 100% accurate. Although tests can perform well in ideal laboratory conditions, 
In real life, lots of other factors affect accuracy, including, and these are important, timing of the test, how the swab was taken, and the handling of the specimen. So all these pre-analytical phases of the test are critical to have an accurate analytical test. Early on in the novel coronavirus outbreak, doctors started reporting cases of people who had coronavirus, which had been missed by swab tests, also known as false negatives. We don't know for sure how often these false negatives occurred in the UK, but evidence from China suggests up to 30 out of every 100 people with coronavirus might test negative. The meaning of the test result for a person depend not only on the accuracy of the test, but also on the estimated risk of disease before testing. And this was described mathematically by Thomas Bayes and later explained by Siddhartha Mukherjee as the law, a strong intuition is much more powerful than a weak test. And they, they explain with this example, they say Jane works at the NHS as a receptionist in a GP surgery in London in an area of high rates of coronavirus infection. After noticing a loss of smell for a few days, she wakes up one night feeling shivery with a dry cough. She checks her temperature and sees it's 38.5 degrees C. How after, after getting the swab test, the test comes back negative for COVID-19. Great news, or is it? Doctors use their experience to recognize patterns of symptoms, risk factors, and signs to estimate the likelihood of infection before testing. This is known as pretest probability. Based on her symptoms, the probability that Jane was COVID-19 or had COVID-19 was pretty high, perhaps in the 80% ballpark. However, let's say 100 people experiencing symptoms like Jane have a swab test. Of these people, 80 actually have COVID-19. A positive test means that We can be pretty certain someone has COVID-19, but if the test misses 30% of those 80 people with COVID-19, this means that an estimated 24 out of every 100 people will have a false negative test result. This means these people might go back to work and unknowingly spread coronavirus to others. These numbers change depending on who is tested. If we test people with fewer symptoms, the likelihood of coronavirus or pretest probability is lower. If only 10 in 100 people tested actually have COVID-19 and 30% are missed by the test, this will mean only 3 in 100 people will have a false negative compared to 86 true negatives. So if you have fewer symptoms and test negative, you can be more assured that you don't actually have COVID-19. But if you have typical symptoms of coronavirus, then it's safe to assume that you have the disease, even if your test is negative, they say. Now, antibody blood tests are also being developed, and these could help. Help us find out who has had coronavirus previously and is therefore presumed, presumed to be immune. This could help inform decisions about lifting lockdowns uh, to allow people to go back to work safely. But before these are rolled out, we need to know how accurate they they are. Uh, This this time, we need to be more confident that the antibody test doesn't falsely reassure people that they are immune, as this could worsen the spread of infection. At the moment, we don't have enough information on these tests to be able to answer these questions. The very limited data available suggests that that they have fewer false negatives than the swab test, but more false positive results. This means there is a possibility that you could test positive without actually being immune. So these tests may not be as helpful as people are hoping. So they say they close out saying the take home message is that testing is important to help us understand and control the coronavirus outbreak, but it has limitations when used to guide decision making for people. If you have a strong symptoms of COVID-19, you should assume you have it, even if your test is negative. So a very interesting um, article by these um, professors or researchers at uh, the University of Bristol that kind of spell out uh, some of the problems with some of the testing. And then they had this study that was published March 11th in, in the JAMA, uh, the Journal of the American Medical Association. And it was 
done in China about the detection of SARS coronavirus 2 in different types of samples. And remember that uh, early on, the, the specimens of choice were the nasopharyngeal swab and the oropharyngeal swab. So let's take a look at this study real quickly and we'll look, we'll look at the, it was done in China and we'll look at the methods. It says, we investigated the biodistribution of SARS coronavirus 2 among different tissues of inpatients with coronavirus disease, uh, diagnosed based on symptoms and radiology and confirmed by SARS coronavirus 2 detection. Um, patients with specimens collected based on clinical indications from three hospitals in the Hubei and Shandong provinces and Beijing um, from January 1st to February 17th were included. Pharyngeal swabs were collected from most patients one to three days after admission. Blood, sputum, feces, urine, and nasal samples were collected throughout the illness. Bronchoalveolar lav lavage fluid and fibrobronchoscope brush biopsies were sampled from patients with severe illness or undergoing mechanical ventilation. And they described the, the PCR testing and how they did that. The results, there were 1,070 specimens collected from 205 patients with COVID-19 who were a mean age of 44 years. Um, about 7 out of 10 of them were men. Most of the patients presented with fever, dry cough, and fatigue. 19% uh, had severe illness. Um, Bronchoalveolar alve lavage fluid specimens showed the highest positive rates, 93%, followed by sputum at 72%, nasal swabs were 63%, and on and on it goes. So, um, somebody was kind enough to post this chart on Twitter, and it, we, we can visualize it a little bit better. And this is from the same journal. So you can see, depending on the type of sample that was collected, uh, the bronchoalveolar lavage was uh, had a much more pos um, higher positive rate than the others. And it, notice the note at the bottom, it says nasal swab will detect only two thirds of cases and pharyngeal swabs will detect only one third of cases. Uh, nasal swab testing is better of two uh, for unadmitted patients. So. Uh, point is that a lot of these swabs, the positivity rates were uh, actually much lower than uh, we would hope uh, in this uh, situation in China. So, so the sputum and, and the anything that was you know coming directly out of the lungs, uh, like the uh, uh, BAL samples, ninety three percent were the best types of samples according to this study. Okay, well, so, that, so that's some of the stuff about some of the early testing. Um, then, you know, the media has been really harping on testing 24-7. Uh, so, and a lot of it's justified. I, I get that. Um, and the administration and the governors uh, have been making lots of promises. Um but there's, there's, there's been issues with this. And um, this is a very interesting little clip with uh, Dr. Mike Osterholm with SIDRAP, who was on MSNBC discussing testing. And so this is going to take about uh, three and a half, four minutes. So let's take a listen to that. Now, the director of the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy and a professor in the medical school at the University of Minnesota, Dr. Michael Osterholm. Uh, doctor, thank you for being on. Uh, I'd you. like to ask first about testing. Um, I, I, at the rate we're going, without it coming from the government, sort of streamlining and, and using perhaps the DPA to get a national uniform, robust mass testing effort, it seems like we're in a kind of a convoluted space where there are some types of testing here, other types of testing there, and then in many cases across the country, non-existent testing. At the rate we're going, without it coming from the government, when are we going to have enough testing that's uniform enough that we can map out this virus and protect ourselves? 
Well, first of all, let me just say that testing has almost become the kind of what you call mantra that we saw post 9-11 where Cipro is, is everything, testing is everything. And I want to be a little cautious about that. I think we've gotten far too ahead of ourselves on the testing issue, what it can and can't do. Uh, first of all, we have a major shortage of testing in large part because of the reagents, the chemicals that we need to run the test. In uh, December of this past year, testing was done routinely around the world for the kind of uh, mm -hmm. tests that we did. And then Wuhan happened and the need for reagents was boosted substantially. Then when the world caught on fire, instead of filling the, the reagent pool with a garden hose, we needed a canal full to fill it and it hasn't happened. So people who go around promising we can deal with this by testing just don't understand the fact that it's going to take us months, even under the most uh, vigorous of efforts, to get the kind of in, uh, the manufacturing for these reagents. The second thing is these testing situations yield a lot of problems. We now know today, for example, the FDA has really, I think, uh, done itself a disservice by when we didn't have enough testing, basically opened it up so almost anybody could now be approved for testing. It's kind of like the Wild West. Right. By their own admission last week, they admitted that of the testing that for the blood testing, of the 70 tests that just got approved, 35 were junk. That's their own right. words. So I think we have to talk about testing in all of its forms. Well, that's why I'm asking, because I, I, nobody can get an yeah. answer on when we can catch up with a country that was able to use testing to get on top of this. Are we ever going to get there? Because, like I said, it's jumbled, it's convoluted, there are, and there are different entities making different types of tests. This seems really disorganized, and you were saying months. It sounds to me like many months. It, well, it is. And, and Mika, you're right on the mark with this. Uh, you know, we've been calling for some time. We need a major national presence to help provide the leadership. And while we need the private sector to be there, basically, we've also got to say, don't promise us. You know, I last week was in a debate with a world renowned econ economist, a Nobel Prize laureate, who said we need to test 30 million people a week. And I said, you can't. And he right. looked at me like I just didn't want to. We can't. So I think you're right. We're a long ways off. But let me add one other thing. People who thought that testing was the answer in Asia, for example, Singapore, Japan, mm -hmm. Uh, Korea, Hong Kong are all having problems right now, even though they have testing in place and they're losing control of what's going on over there. So I just want to add a, a word of caution to say before everybody jumps too far in the bandwagon, let's understand what testing can and can't do. It's important. We need it and we don't have it, but it's also not going to be the savior that many people put out there that it will be. All right. So let's talk, Dr. Just. All right. So, yeah, that's some important stuff there. And, and there's a lot of reality going on there. Um, a lot of these co companies were not prepared uh, to manufacture such large quantities of a lot of these reagents. Uh, so uh, lysis buffer, extraction reagents, um, swabs, uh, viral transport media, a whole bunch of stuff um, it was on a very short supply for all the testing that was required throughout the country. So that's one thing. And uh, I thought Michael, uh, Dr. Osterholm uh, pointed that out pretty well. Okay, let's um, go to the next slide and let's talk about antibody testing a little bit. In, in this report, they say, scientists don't know if recovering from COVID-19 confers immunity or not. And it says, even as virologists zero in on the virus that causes COVID-19, a very basic question remains unanswered. Do those who recover from the disease have immunity? And there's no clear answer to this. Uh, even in, if many have assumed that contracting the potentially deadly disease confers immunity, at least for a while. Uh, being immunized means that you have developed an immune response against the virus, such that you can repulse it, explain Eric Vivier, a professor of immunology at the public hospital system in Marseille. Our immune systems remember, which normally prevent you from being infected by some virus, that same virus later on. But some viral diseases, such as measles, overcoming the sickness confers immunity for a lifetime. But for RNA-based viruses, such as SARS coronavirus 2, uh, the scientific name for the virus that causes COVID-19 disease, it takes about three weeks to build up a sufficient quantity of antibody. And even then, 
They may provide protection for only a few months, he said. At least that is the theory. In reality, the new coronavirus has thrown up one surprise after another, to the point where virologists and epidemiologists are sure of very little. Very well said. We do not have the answers to that. It's an unknown, said Michael Ryan, exec- executive director for the World Health Organization's Emergencies Program. Um, when asked about how long a recovered COVID-19 patient would have immunity. We would expect that to be a reasonable period of protection, but it is very difficult to say with a new virus. We can only extrapolate from other coronaviruses, and even that data is quite limited. For SARS, back in 2003, which killed about 800 people across the world, um, recovered patients remained protected for about three years on average. According to Francois Ballou, uh, director of the Genetics Institute at the University College of London, one can certainly get reinfected, but after how much time? We'll only know retroactively. So very important points there. We'll have these antibody tests. People that come up positive, okay, they've been exposed if the test is good. Um, But how much immunity has been conferred? We're not going to know. Is it going to be like measles? Not likely. It's going to be, it's not going to be lifelong immunity. Not likely. It's going to be much shorter. How short? Because this is important because they're trying to base a lot of decisions on getting things back to normal based on these antibody tests. When can people start going back to work? When can you travel? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And let me go ahead and close uh, with this. And this is concerning the testing. And it says, coronavirus testing must double or triple before U.S. can safely reopen. And this was um, over a week ago, an NBC report. And it says, testing for the coronavirus would have to be at least doubled or tripled from its current levels to allow even a partial reopening of America's economy, public health experts say. But it's unclear how soon such an ambitious goal could be reached amid persistent shortages of testing supplies, as Dr. Osterholm explained, and they say a lack of coordination from the Trump administration. Without diagnostic testing on a massive scale, federal and state officials and private companies will lack a clear picture of who has been infected, who can safely return to work, how the virus is spreading, and when stay-at-home orders can be eased. Well, we already know that's already changing already in in several states and probably many to follow as the economy is is falling apart and people need to get back to work. Uh, Dylan George, he's an infectious disease modeling expert who advised the Obama administration during the Ebola outbreak. We are an order of magnitude off right now from where we should be. Testing is a perpetual problem here. And so right now, what we do know is there's been 5.2 million people tested uh, with the PCR test in the United States. And that's small. That's a hair over 1%, I believe. But that's what's been done so far. So, yeah, there's a lot of lofty goals. The uh, Trump just recently, this past week, um, signed that latest bill in which it was like 484 billion and 25 billion is supposed to be for diagnostic testing and that's going to filter down to the states and and they're going to start ramping up more and more testing um as that's what politicians are promising and that seems like that's what a lot of the people want so testing will be ramped up um how's it going to affect everything in the long run that's a big unknown but so we went over quite a few things today, how it all started, the, the bumbling in Atlanta, um, antibody test, you know, how some of these tests work, what they're looking for um, going forward. And uh, this will clearly become an, continue to be an issue for some time to come. So we'll be keeping a close eye on this at OutbreakNewsToday.com. Um, be listening soon. I'll be doing an interview with Dr. Osterholm on Tuesday, uh, discussing some issues concerning testing and and other issues uh, surrounding COVID. So be on the lookout for that on Outbreak News interviews. And um, 
I'll see you next time on Outbreak News TV. Please share it with your friends. See ya.